broke into my cave. In the last few episodes, we've been looking at transistor beta, the ratio by which the transistor amplifies the current at the base to give the current to the collector. Today I'd like to take a quick look at some of the techniques that can be used to extract more gain from a circuit. Circuit gain comes in several forms. The one we most think about in audio synthesis is voltage gain, since we most often represent our signals as voltages. But we've seen throughout this series that sometimes what we need is current gain, particularly because it can be used to match impedances. And often what is really important is power gain, how much power, voltage times current, we can deliver to a given load. I'll defer discussing power gain until later, because designing power amplifiers is kind of a specialized topic. I'll start with current gain, because that's closest to the fundamental way that a transistor works, at least as we understand things so far. Recall that we've been saying that for any transistor biased in the active region, the collector current will be the base current times the transistor's beta. Our friend, the transistor person, works tirelessly, adjusting the resistance between collector and emitter to keep the current at that value. So there isn't much we can do about current gain, right? Well, maybe not for a given transistor, but we have options as designers. The simplest and most brutal option is simply to pick out a transistor with a bigger beta. These are often referred to as super beta transistors. There is a wide selection out there. One that's cheap and plentiful is the 2N5089. The big distributors literally stock it by the million. The datasheet promises a beta of 450 over quite a range of collector currents. The 2SC3624A promises a beta in the 1000 range, and the dual LS301 promises the astonishing beta of 3000. Of course, nothing is free in this world. Super beta transistors have a few gotchas. Their early effect is much worse. That will limit the voltage gain you can get out of these puppies. They often work at a lower voltage limit. For example, the LS301 has a limit of 18 volts collector to emitter. You won't be able to run it off plus or minus 12 volt op amp supplies. And the beta is often specified at an inconveniently high current. For instance, the 2SC3624A is specified at a collector current of 1 milliamp. That will often mean you need quite a small emitter resistor, which would imply a small base resistance, which would defeat the purpose of having such a high beta in the first place. So, as always, read the data sheets carefully. With all this said, these transistors are really popular as preamplifiers for low-level signals. In those, you also have to watch out for noise, but low noise design would need a whole other series to explain. The remaining ideas to boost current gain all come from the simple idea that you can take a circuit, say, an emitter follower, and boost its current gain simply by driving its base with another follower. Both collectors are going to the same place, so let's just tie them together instead of drawing two power symbols. The physicist Sidney Darlington drew just this circuit in 1953 and noticed that the pair of transistors look like a single three-legged device that replaces the original transistor. He realized that this device could replace a transistor in other contexts. We now know this device as the Darlington pair. To look at the Darlington pair in more detail, let's redraw it with labels for all the currents. It's not too hard to analyze. The base of Q2, and hence the emitter of Q1, are at a diode drop above the emitter of Q2. The base of Q1 is a diode drop higher than that. Q1's beta tells us its collector current, and Kirchhoff's law gives the emitter current, which is also Q2's base current. Q2's beta then gives us its collector current, and Kirchhoff's current law sums the two collector currents. Where does all this algebra get us? A Darlington pair does indeed replace a single transistor. Its beta is approximately the product of the betas of the two transistors in the pair. Its base emitter drop is two diode drops rather than one. Let's build one on the breadboard and see it working. Here's what I'll breadboard. There's the Darlington pair that we looked at. 
I'll send it a 5 volt signal through a 3.3 mega ohm resistor to simulate a high impedance source. And I'll load it with a white LED with a dropping resistor making it draw about 20 milliamperes. On the breadboard, I'm trying first the single transistor. The LED looks like a glowworm because the transistor doesn't have enough current gain to light it brightly. The meter shows just over 300 microamperes. If I switch the jumper over to make the circuit a Darlington pair, there's plenty of current to make the LED too bright to look at directly. There are a few more important details to watch out for when you use Darlington pairs. Probably the most important one is that the saturation voltage is always at least a diode drop. To show you why this is, I've set up a little simulation on CircuitJS. Link down in the doobly-doo. This Darlington is biased into saturation. What we see happening is that the driver transistor is saturated. It's behaving like a short circuit between the base and collector of the output transistor. It's always providing just enough base current that the output transistor collector can't fall below the base. The base is, of course, a diode drop above the emitter, so the collector-to-emitter voltage difference has to be at least a diode drop. I know this one's a tough concept. I encourage you to play around with changing the values in CircuitJS until you get it. If you're designing the biasing for low-voltage circuits, or if you're figuring the power dissipation of the output transistor, you'll need to take the higher saturation voltage into account. This behavior isn't entirely a disadvantage. Big transistors that go into saturation can be really slow to go back into the active region. Keeping the output transistor free from saturating can help the frequency response of the circuit. But there's something else working against the speed of a Darlington. A power Darlington, in particular, can be slow to turn off if you drop the base voltage suddenly. The reason is that a power transistor can have a fair amount of capacitance between the base and the other two leads. When the input transistor turns off, the charge on this capacitance has nowhere to go but the base emitter diode of the output transistor, so it provides base current for a little while extra. The simple fix for this is to install a resistor between the base and emitter of the output transistor. Generally speaking, the resistor should be just big enough that it doesn't steal a substantial fraction of the base current. The value will usually range from a few kilo ohms for a small signal circuit to a few hundred ohms for a big power transistor. Darlington pairs are useful enough that the manufacturers sell many, many different varieties of packaged pairs. One favorite of mine is the MMBTA14, a small signal one that the distributors stock by hundreds of thousands. It's good for matching high impedance sources, and it costs only pennies in quantity, making it an ideal sort of part for a hacker to just keep around. For everyday applications that need a power transistor, the TIP120 series is a perennial favorite. They can switch up to about 5 amperes, so they're good to drive small stepper motors and such like. And packaged Darlingtons come in sizes that are absolute beasts. The MJ11028 series can switch up to 50 amps at 120 volts. You see them in things like variable frequency drives for big motors. A set of these, in the right sort of bridge setup, can drive the windings of a 10 horsepower to a 08 volt three-phase motor. A variation on the same theme as the Darlington pair goes by the name of the Sikli pair. It, too, starts by considering an output transistor and using another transistor to drive its base. This time, though, the driver transistor is complementary. That is, if the output transistor is NPN, the driver is PNP, and vice versa. We can analyze it the same way that we did the Darlington pair, by working through the currents one at a time. Since the math is pretty much the same as with the Darlington, I'll run through it on autopilot. Watch out, of course, that the currents in a PNP run the other way from the NPN that we most often use.
What's the takeaway here? The Sigli pair looks like a single transistor. The polarity is the same as the driver transistor, or opposite to the output transistor. Since we started here with an NPN output transistor, the whole circuit looks like a PNP. Back in the day, you would see it in almost every audio power amp, because PNP power transistors... <coughs> uh, the YouTube algorithm doesn't like the language I was about to use. PNP power transistors had less than ideal properties. The final stage would be a push-pull with two NPN power transistors. One wired as a Sikli, and the other as a Darlington. One advantage of the Sikli for push-pulls is that its base emitter voltage is just one diode drop, not the two that the Darlington has. Don't confuse this with the collector emitter saturation voltage. That's still got an extra diode drop, the same as for the Darlington. In a push-pull amplifier, it's easier to get better linearity, because there will be a diode-less crossover distortion. The main thing that I don't like about it is that it doesn't come prepackaged like a single transistor. That's because the manufacturing process winds up being optimized to produce good transistors of one polarity. The other polarity will usually not perform nearly as well. Just as with the Darlington, if you don't need the absolute highest input impedance, you'll get better linearity and faster turnoff time if you add a resistor from base to emitter of the output transistor. Once again, that will range from typically a couple hundred ohms for a big power transistor to a few K for a small signal. I think that's all that I want to say right now about current gain. The next thing to look at is voltage gain. But this has turned once again into a longer video than I intended. So I'm going to have to put off voltage gain until next time. Thanks for watching, and I hope you stay tuned for that. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious, and take care of one another. Bye!